Hello, you are listening to the Animalia Hour on KGVM. We are a podcast based in Bozeman, Montana, committed to environmentalism, human health, and redefining our relationship to other animals. We hope through this podcast to inspire you to live vegan for the same reasons. I'm Kevin. I'm Lucy. Hi, I'm Sarah. Thanks for being with us today. We're going to be spending some time talking about marketing, the power of advertising, and how we want to be intelligent, informed people, especially when it comes to um, consuming what we consume. Um, And just to, I, I hope that, you know, all of us, we all need to be reminded of this, I think, but, you know, hopefully at some point in our education, we learn that advertising, they are not above lying to us, right? Like their, their main goal is not telling the truth. Right. Their main goal is... Selling their product. Yeah. The right. bottom, their bottom line, their profit, their, uh, yeah, making as much money as quickly as they can. And, you know, marketing is really effective and it's, they're really smart about it and they know... Um, well, how, yeah, they hire the best people in the world, psychologists, you know, right. experts uh, to, to do their bidding. Right. And so this is, when it comes to animal agribusiness, I think this is a somewhat new phenomenon. Uh, like I would say definitely over the past couple decades at the most that, you know, especially people who do vegan outreach have really noticed a change in and how the conversations go when they have, when they are talking to someone or they, you know, we show a person footage from, you know, animal agriculture or from slaughter, uh, just standard practices and people are horrified, right? Because, uh, this is kind of like the, the, the silver lining on this whole thing is that people are compassionate. People want to live in a world with less suffering, with less cruelty, with less misery. And so, you know, the animal agriculture industry knows that. Right. And so in the past couple of decades, they have employed marketing experts to create uh, advertising and labeling that have really made a great impression on people's, when I say great, I mean a a noticeable, palpable, measurable difference in how people think about animal agriculture. Right. It's seeped into their, into their minds, right? Right. So it used to be when, when you, and and I'm not speaking from personal experience because I haven't been doing outreach all that long, but when you listen to people who have been vegan activists for decades, they say, this didn't used to be a problem when you talk to, to the public. It used to be you would show them the footage or you would talk to them about standard practices or you'd talk to them about how horrible a- animal agriculture is for, for the animals, for the world, for our health, whatever. And people c- knew instinctively, I have, I have a choice here. I can either ignore what this person's telling me and... and put my blinders on and just continue down my path or I can become vegan. It's one or the other. Right. Um, I do a bunch of outreach these days and it's only been since last year, but literally every single conversation, all, almost every single conversation I have starts being, a, uh, starts being about veganism and then just like straight away after the footage, they go right to humane, even sometimes before the footage. Um, and I think it's, you know, like, and even when in the video, actually, you say that these are humane practices, or like a lot of them are humane practices and standard, because I show a video like with these practices. They're considered humane practices. They're considered humane by the industry, of course. Um, they, they still go there. <laughs> and they, you know, like that's, um, I think it's it's interesting to hear from other activists from other like times, like in the 90s or 2000s or whatever saying that this was different because for me it's literally every single conversation now <laughs> that's that's where that yeah. and i experienced that in the little bit of outreach i did too and i just thought it was amazing you know there was a person who watched the footage we show like 3 minutes of footage and she was clearly upset she was crying her emo- she was very emotional 
And she had her dog with her. She was like, oh, if anything remotely like that ever happened to my dog, it would just be, I would die, you know. Um, But then almost immediately, her mind went to, oh, I really need to try to get my eggs and my meat from small, humane, local farms. Um, Like somehow, in in her mind, she just immediately went there. Right. And of course, I was thinking, okay, let's go back to your dog, right? Your dog has a very happy life. You take good care of your dog. You give your dog plenty of attention and exercise and nutrition. So that your dog is being humanely raised. Right. Okay. So if we, if we're like, okay, it's okay to eat your dog. It's okay to slaughter and eat your dog because your dog had a good life. Like, does that somehow make it okay? Uh, Right. Well, I think, I think what's just stuck out to me right there, too, is I think also because another media campaign is that people think through their physicians, through the FDA, through, you know, food guidelines and through all of the, you know, ag, ag industry advertising that they actually need eggs and, and the lobbying meat. from these Yeah, industries. all these things. They actually, but all the advertising, you know, mm-hmm. milk mustache, got milk, you know, beef, it's what's for dinner you know, the incredible edible egg, all these things, everyone thinks they need this for nutrition and they don't. And so, I mean, that's part of it. Like, like, do you you understand what I'm saying? Like, like that person was like, well, damn, where am I going to get my eggs? I need to get them from a humane place. Well, how about you don't need your eggs? So it's a two pronged, it's a two pronged, what would you say? Philosophy or um, paradigm. It's like number one, like you said, I totally, I love that you brought that up. Number one, first of all, it's a necessary evil. Mm -hmm. Like right. in order to survive or thrive or be healthy, we we have to eat animal flesh and animal secretions. Right. Okay. So can we do it in the most nice, humane way? Yeah. You know, so it's like this two pronged belief system that that keeps it going. Right. Keeps it going. Yeah. No, hundred uh, percent. So I really liked. Um, so I guess, for, for, let me back up. Uh, a lot of this conversation today is inspired by an anthology that was just published this year. It's a brand new book, uh, published 2023. Um, the author, or sorry, the compiler or the editor, yeah, the editor. is um, Hope Bohannik. And she um, she was able to to get 18 different contributing authors to write chapters on the humane hoax. And the title of the book is Humane Hoax, Essays Exposing the Myth of Happy Meat, Humane Dairy, and Ethical Eggs. Uh, so it's, a, it's an anthology. It's 18 chapters. It's really exhaustive, really informative, very interesting. Right. We highly recommend checking this book out. And these people are like highly educated. I mean, it's very sophisticated Mm -hmm. arguments, uh, discussion, Mm -hmm. you know, some of them, many, I think most of them PhDs, I mean, just smart people. So, And also people who have been living close to these rescued individuals from farmed situations. Uh, So they have seen firsthand what it does to animals, like even these humane farms, these small family farms. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... So yeah, this book kind of goes through point by point, uh, whether it's humane washing, like we've already been talking about. Also, it goes into real depth on green washing, the green washing of animal agribusiness, that somehow it can be done in a way that doesn't destroy the planet. Um, so there's a lot to, to look through with this book. And you know, we may or may not get through it all today. We right. will definitely be back to the topic uh, because there's a lot here to look at and, and it's, it's really important stuff. Right. But yeah, I wanted to read from um, a chapter that, that does talk about the word extreme. I thought this was really helpful because like, like we were talking about with like that conversation that I had at during outreach where you could, you could see in her mind she wanted to find a middle way between supporting cruelty and the, you know, in her mind, the extreme of going vegan. She wanted to find somewhere in the middle where she could have a clean conscience, but not have to change her lifestyle very much. Um, so the book reads, uh, this perception of veganism being too extreme is part of what feeds the popularity of animal products labeled, quote, 
humane. The idea that there are kinder, gentler ways of breeding and killing animals on a smaller scale is highly appealing to a public seeking anesthetization against complicity with an industry that is increasingly being exposed for its cruel practices. People want to believe they don't have to take what are, quote, extreme measures that deviate from the norm of meat eating or make what is perceived as drastic changes. The industry is offering a middle ground where you can buy, a, buy cage-free eggs and organic dairy and happy meat. What consumers don't realize is that labels lie, and extreme suffering is inherent in all animal agriculture. Um, it made me, you know, like think about, you know, like uh, the fact that vegans are seen as extreme, right? It's an extreme lifestyle. I've been told that so many times. <laughs> um, mm. In a world of violence like ours, especially towards the animals, um, the lesser violence is seen as a better option. That does not mean that it's not violent still, right? And uh, the, the choice that is the least violent, which is veganism, <sighs> or not violent at all because we don't exploit animals directly is seen as the extreme because it's so extremely removed from this world of that violence, the norm of violence, mm -hmm. right? And I wanted to um, uh, also talk about something I use in outreach, which is um, <clears throat> interesting with w the example you talked about. Uh, often when people um, talk about the humane farming and how that might be the solution, um, I ask them in outreach, um, how do you humanely kill someone who doesn't want to die? And often <laughs> the, the reactions are really interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they sometimes go to the, the place of like, but they're not someone, but then it's like, why do you kill something that's someone, et cetera. But often in, they, they are honest and they say, well, you can't really because they don't want to die. Like it's not euthanasia or something. And how right. do you also, further than that, how do you commodify someone at all? Right. You know, how do you exploit someone's body humanely? Mm. Right. Right. I mean, I love what I love that you brought in. Like, yeah, we're we're so enculturated as a society. We're so enculturated to believe that violence is just the way it is, and violence is necessary. And so, it's considered extreme to be like, let's let's get rid of unnecessary violence. It's not necessary. Right. Uh, like that. That's considered extreme. Um, that is crazy. That is crazy. I mean, and the things were so like siloed in our thinking, like you've got all these great people that are trying to reduce, you know, war in our in our world and doing all these protests against war and, and voting uh, against politicians who were pro war and companies and that whole thing. But then they'll go eat, you know, a steak or something. You know what I mean? There's this disconnect. And yeah. it. And as we've read already, and we can we've got into in our shows, is that there's so much violence in the meat industry, in the ag, animal ag industry. It's it's horrific, and it's on the level of you know I don't want to use the word Holocaust, but I mean it's it's horrific. It's millions. It's three trillion animals yeah. per year. Yeah. When I mean counting fish because fish feel pain as well and are treated horribly as well, so I'm exploited. Yeah, it's some of the worst violence and bloodshed we've seen. Well, I mean, I think we can we can see this trend to try to deceive ourselves to pacify our conscience. Like, you know, it doesn't just happen with animals. That's what our focus today and on this show. But it's just worth pointing out. Historically, we have done the same thing with all kinds of, you know, uh, systems that are disgusting and cruel. I mean, how many times have... Do we even sometimes still hear people say, well, some of the slaveholders were humane and kind to their slaves, yeah. right? Um, or the idea that, that the system of slavery, like how, you know, kind of like to mirror your question. So you ask people, how do you humanely kill someone who doesn't want to die? Right. right? That gets, that boils it right down. Whereas you could, you could equivalent that to someone who, is equivalent a word? Anyway, <laughs> you could say um, similarly, uh, like, yeah, how do you 
enslave people humanely? Right. Is there a humane or way means, yeah. to take away <laughs> someone's freedom and own them and and enslave them? Is there a humane way to do well, that? Well, and, and yeah, it, we've even you know heard people make arguments that actually uh, the slaves are being taken care of; they're being treated better. Like in slavery, you know what I mean? Like, like we hear with the wild animals versus farmed <laughs> animals. Yeah, yeah. yeah Than if they were on their own, right? Yeah, yeah. right, right. So, uh, so yeah. Going along with that, you know, sh- this this author says, you know, what's truly extreme is slitting the throat of a sentient animal, causing her to choke to death on her blood, cutting her up, cooking her, and eating her. That might also be considered very extreme if we take the vantage point of compassion to be normative, instead of accepting violence as such. With this compassion as our center of orientation, eating animals is certainly extremely cruel, extremely disturbing, and extremely disgusting. How is choosing beans over blood too extreme? How is wanting to reduce harm to animals too extreme? How is choosing food that could help reverse climate change and heart disease too extreme? Right. You know, it's funny, uh, that, that just reminds me of Dr. Esselton, right? I mean, he, he makes, he uses a similar argument when he, he's a, he's a surgeon, he's a heart surgeon, and he uses a similar argument when it comes to heart surgery. People eat animal products, they get all the saturated uh, fat in their arteries, clogs their arteries, and they have to have open heart surgery. I mean, and he just describes in some level of detail, like ripping someone's chest open you know, cutting into them and just opening them up and doing the surgery and, and replacing their valves. And I mean, how extreme is that? Having your chest cavity yeah. opened Especially up. Especially for like a reason so trivial, like convenience or taste or culture. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely unnecessary. So, yeah. So if you haven't figured it out, it's, it's, what we're talking, some of what we're talking about are these labels that are so uh, ubiquitous or so, plentiful when you go into your grocery store and you look at uh, animal secretions or animal flesh that is labeled, you know, grass fed or cage free or organic meat or free range or uh, I th- what's the one I heard um, at Whole Foods? <laughs> I hope it's okay. We're talking specifically about yeah. a brand, but um, or oh, halal, I guess. Or well. sure, sure. Um, kosher halal yeah Mm -hmm. but yeah i heard that if you go into the meat department at whole foods everything has a sticker on it that says i think certified humane (laughs) and one of our friends was talking about this that he actually confronted the poor kid (laughs) in the meat department like how do you know who who's there to prove it who's there you know like making sure that this animal was humanely and what do right. you even mean by humane? Yeah, what's like, the definition? You humane? Certified humane? Yeah, yeah. Certified humane. That's crazy. So yeah, the the compiler of this book, Hope uh, Bohannik, her she says throughout the book, like, please just don't be fooled. Please don't waste your money. Like people are paying a lot of extra money uh, above and beyond what the conventional eggs or the conventional meat, you know, milk would cost because they think somehow that they're they are supporting a more sustainable humane animal agriculture and that in doing that the welfare of animals overall is going to improve and you know even just a small amount of research illustrates the fact that no these animals lives are in no way better Uh, in fact and we can get into some of how they describe it Actually, sometimes uh, under the humane label or the organic label, sometimes the animals' lives are significantly worse. Also, something that we kind of forget, like we don't really think about, um, is that when you purchase these humane label products, um, you're actually paying more for these products, right? And so you're giving more money to the industry. Um, So it means you're giving more to Mm -hmm. animal agriculture in general. And that means more animals get killed. And actually, you know, now is more than ever, there's just more um, animals that are killed and exploited per year than ever. Like, And this is the humane era, you know, like humane labeled products. Mm -hmm. Like there's never been as many, right? So what does that tell us? Um, It makes people feel good about buying the the bodies and secretions of these 
yeah. killed animals. So, but it's it also makes sense, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Like the philosophy of it all, right? I mean, this it was kind of an ingenious way for the industry. It's very smart. Yeah, the ag industry to create a way to even make even more money is to make people feel good about themselves that they're that they're actually not doing anything too horrible. So they don't. Also, they've realized that they don't need to make all of their products labeled humane, e- humane either, because there's this psychological um, process that happens in people's minds where it's. I think it's called the psychological refuge. It's basically you. You refuge. just uh, re- refuge. Refuge. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you don't even need to uh, know that you're buying like humane, whatever that means, products. You can just know that they're out there, and you assume. That mm-hmm. you're buying that for, because uh. it's it's just easy psychologically to feel better about it that way, and and so just by having a few products um, with like uh, specific labels, um, they make more money, but they also make people think that in general the m- the whole industry is more aware and they're trying harder and uh. um, and you know. So they're supporting, in essence, they're supporting humane treatment. You know tangentially or whatever yeah. like you and know. they assume like uh, when i talk to people they always always say like oh i buy him in my my you know products on like mm-hmm. which is it's not technically possible <laughs> yeah right. i think i think the book even at some point in the book refers to this phenomenon as orwellian which maybe you could explain <laughs> because i think yeah the idea that um the people in power are actually things are actually getting worse and worse and worse, but the people's perception is that things are getting better and better and better. Wow. And so, you know, it's kind of this uh, terrible uh, disconnect. So, yeah, I really thought it was interesting that this book opens, um, you know, and she intentionally opened the book with two chapters that are kind of personal stories or testimonial kind of chapters of what most people would think of as the most humane animal agriculture scenarios possible, which the first one was just a small, it took place on a small family run, family owned uh, pig farm, just very small scale. I think they said they had about 40 pigs at a time. Um, and, and the person talks about actually how, how terrible their lives, the, the pigs lives were and how, they ended up, the mom figure of the family um, decided to take one of the runts who was destined to be killed at birth. She, For whatever reason, she took the runt into the home. And the, the author of that chapter just says, you know, I think my mom had just seen so much death that she just wanted to feel like she was rescuing at least one from that. And But this, this pig was treated like a pet, um, you know, enjoys socializing with the family and playing games and, um, you know, enjoyed time with the family. Like, you know, was being socialized into, like, family life. But, of course, at, at some point... And so, like, the, the author says, like, I, I viewed our pet, our pig, as somehow different and special, unlike those dirty, stupid pigs that were out in the barn wow. or out on pasture. Um, you know, that's how she perceived it as a child. She saw she made a a clear distinction between the one that they were caring for and the ones that they didn't care for. But the pig got too big and ended up getting cast out of the house. And she remembers as a child, like the pig still wanted to spend time with the family, would come running up to them. And whereas all the other pigs would shirk away whenever they came around and try to hide and Hmm. uh, were very suspicious of the humans. And the pig ended up meeting the same demise as all the rest. So well, that's what they say about pigs, right? They're very social and they're very intelligent. It's I, I remember also what she said about the what happened to the pig. Like when she asked her mom about what happened to that pig, the mom said, "I'd like to think that he had a good li- like a good end of life that was swift or something like that." Mm-hmm. Like, it, yeah. it was straight away not talking about the reality of what happened, but what she'd like to think. And right, what, and what happened to that pig is he had a bad day, right? She. Yes. She. she. I'm I think sorry. I think it was a she. Or maybe I'm wrong. She had a bad day. But just yeah, one so bad day. <laughs> like the staggering thing about was. that is it's it's not just the city dweller, um, you know, never been on a farm person who's so easily deluded into not wanting to think about the realities. Even the farmer, the farmer's family who do this for a living 
are capable of deluding themselves into, you know, wanting to believe that, oh, it's really not so bad, or, you know, somehow that pig lived out her days naturally or happily or something, even though they really deep down inside, they know the truth. They know what happened to that pig and that it was not good. It was not pleasant. It wasn't nice. If anything, they need that more, that denial more, because it's their job. Mm. I mean, if, if they're not going to change their job, they need to cope with it, right? Right. Good point. Good point. And then the second chapter is written by someone who um, runs their own animal sanctuary, specifically a sanctuary for hens and roosters. And it's about the actual reality of backyard eggs. And I think, you know, we've talked about this on this show before that, you know, a lot of people look at backyard eggs as being benign and being a happy solution. And these hens look so happy and what could be wrong with taking their eggs? That's the perception that's out there. That's like the humane hoax of backyard eggs, I guess. And the chapter goes through, well, no, consider, you know, where where these chicks came from. You're supporting the hatcheries. Where are their parents, right? The, their parents have lived tortured lives as breeders. Where are their brothers? Roosters are useless in the egg industry. And so whether we're talking about a large-scale factory farm or a small family-run egg farm, or someone's backyard hens, roosters are waste products, and they're expendable. And you know that to me, that is the, one of the most uh, you know gets me emotionally is when you really think about yeah when you look at someone's backyard collection of hens, stop and think about where are their brothers, what happened to their brothers, and they're mar- macerated or they're they're asphyxiated in a bag or trash bag or something. Right. Right. And so uh, what, what happens a l- is a lot of time when people order their backyard chicks, um, you know, either there's mistakenly, there's r- little baby roosters in there and they discover later that, oops, this isn't a hen, this is a rooster. Or sometimes the hatcheries will ship the little chicks intentionally packing them with roosters as packing material to try to help... Uh, you know, the little hens stay alive. And so what has occurred because of this trend of more and more people having backyard hens is that there's more and more unwanted roosters who are getting abandoned a lot of times. Or there are animal sanctuaries who will willingly take in farmed animals and let them live, you know, uncommodified lives uh, they they get maxed out and they 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 get to the point where we cannot take any more roosters we just can't and so you know like they 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 talk a lot about how you know they're trying desperately to find homes for these roosters and and are really struggling to uh, there's a portion of this book where um, there was this neighborhood in California where this author lives where you know just a lot of people were abandoning their chickens. And so, you know, people might drop them off thinking, oh, I'll drop the rooster there. There's lots of chickens there. They're obviously doing okay. They'll, they'll be all right. Um, but roosters are really territorial. So the more roosters that were being introduced into this area, the more that, you know, some of them were getting basically pecked to death and, and traumatized. And so there's a story in the book where um, she gets called to this area because there was a rooster almost dead uh, because it had been traumatized by another rooster. She ends up taking it because there was nowhere else to take this him. Sorry, I just said it. But she ends up taking this uh, rooster home, and it takes him several days, several days to even just start to move and be interested in eating and drinking. And you know, then he starts bathing himself and washing off all the dried blood and she ends up having this amazing relationship with this rooster where he's just so he has so much personality and affection and he gets so excited to spend time and and follows her around and makes little noises and wants to cuddle i mean it's just a really beautiful little story and she she just makes the point that the only reason this rooster needed to be rescued was because people eat eggs 
And so make that connection that the as soon as you, I mean, this is just one of many problems with taking eggs from hens is that we're creating the surplus of roosters that nobody wants. Right. Yeah, it's sad. Also, something she she mentioned that was a uh, very a very good point. I thought was that these animals have been bred by us. They have been domesticated, and they're not wild animals. They cannot necessarily uh, like survive in nature. They mm-hmm. don't have what it takes necessarily, like the the wild animals that they come from. Um, so that's a an interesting thing to think about. And right. also something that people really don't know enough about, and that sanctuary, sanctuaries uh, deal with is that. Hens uh, need to eat their own he- uh, their own eggs because of uh, the vitamin D and the phosphorus. I think it is and, calcium. Um, and the calcium that they lose per egg. It's just a lot, and they have you know hollow bones, etc. So they they've been bred to overproduce eggs, and so they really do need to eat egg that they produce to replenish themselves and to not have their bones break. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we can't even make the argument that it's uh, harmless to take the eggs from the backyard uh, hens once you have them. Oh, totally. Absolutely. And I think also uh, along with that, if you allow them to collect a, a clutch of eggs, the way birds are uh, is that they, they relax and they stop feeling like they have to keep laying. If you keep taking the eggs from the hens, they their bodies feel like they have to just keep trying to create a clutch of eggs so that they can brood on their eggs. So, so for so many reasons, the most humane thing to do is, is leave their eggs to them. And, you know, I think there's even um, supplements you can give them to help them to stop ovulating Mm -hmm. every single day, you know, to slow down Mm -hmm. that production of eggs. So just like any bird on the planet, um, you know, the ancestors of the laying hen, the laying chicken, would lay a clutch a year in the springtime and would lay for a few days until she had collected a few eggs. And then she would brood them. And so that's the instinct, that's the underlying instinct of the hen is to be able to collect a clutch so that she can sit on them. Um, but when we're continually taking those eggs, taking those eggs, taking those eggs, they, they can never relax and and their bodies can't, you know, resist the urge to keep laying. So, so that's one reason to just let them keep their eggs. The second reason would be when, when hens are so minerally deficient, which is what happens when we've created this Frankenstein animal that totally unnaturally uh, ovulates almost every single day of her life, her adult life, she becomes very minerally deficient to the point where, you know, all kinds of problems, actually. Um, right. And so lots of times when, when hens become so minerally deficient, they will eat their own eggs just to replenish their minerals. And so that's another reason we should just let them keep their eggs. Uh, it's just a more humane it's a more humane course of action, just leaving them alone, leaving their bodily secretions alone, and, and trying to let them live the most healthy life they can. Right, let nature take over. Right. Yeah, and stop. Yeah, stop taking from them. Okay. Yeah, another thing she brings up in this book, and by the way, she also has a podcast. It's called Hope for the Animals. It's a really great podcast. But uh, and she's interviewed some of the other uh, author contributors to this book, uh, the Humane Hoax. But I think one of the things she brings up is she doesn't like to use the word or the words factory farm because I think in her view, any kind of commercial farm, whether it's small, picture perfect farm. Um, or a big factory farm. They're all the same. And at that point, it just becomes a matter of scale, right? Exactly. They all are using the same standard accepted practices. Uh, And this is one of the things that really drives me crazy. It just seems like more and more in mainstream culture, people will say things like, oh, yeah, factory farms are are terrible. You know, we, we, we need to do something about factory farms. And that's as far as it goes. It's like everybody has agreed that factory mm-hmm. farming is terrible. But in terms of, okay, well, what's the logical step? What is something you could do about that? Well, no, we, we don't want to go there. It's just, it's almost become like... It's the system that has to change. Yeah, it's almost like it's, it's culturally cool now to say, yeah, factory farms are terrible places. But the, it's like there's no responsibility or accountability on the part of the individual to stop supporting 
animal agriculture. The author writes, it is significant to note that in some counties and states, if the cruel and routine standard practices of farming without anesthesia, castration, tail cutting, horn cauterization, branding, tooth filing, toe extraction, uh, that happens to turkeys especially, if those were things were inflicted on a dog or a cat, the perpetrator would face felony animal cruelty charges. Uh, but there are exemptions to animal cruelty laws for agriculture farming practices. And again, these happen whether it's at in a factory farm or whether it's happening on a much smaller scale farm. Uh, there's another quote. So Robert Grillo, or Grillo, G-R-I-L-L-O, has a great book, uh, Farm to Fable. I love his title. Yeah. Farm to Fable. Uh, and he writes uh, on this topic, the truth is that all commercial farming, so in other words, any farm that is for profit, right? right. Uh, all commercial farming qualifies as factory farming based on the ancient production model of using animals as resource objects with total control over their reproduction, the stealing and trafficking of their offspring, standard bodily manipulations, both physically and psychologically traumatizing, destruction of their families and social order, intensive biological manipulation and selective breeding, and of course, the systematic domination, violence, and slaughter in their infancy or adolescence. All of the above are necessary in any kind of farming to render their flesh and secretions into products of consumption. So again, all of those things are necessary at any farm wow. in order to profit, <laughs> to commodify their flesh and their secretions. So well written. It that is. So I amazing. Mean, that really puts things in perspective, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, there is, an, even on the family run, f you know, friendly, small, local farm, those animals are not considered individuals. Their best interest is not part of the equation when it comes to making decisions about their destiny or their lives. Uh, their, their lives are measured literally in dollars and cents in terms of what can be taken from them and what kind of profit they will bring to the farmer. So anytime you're thinking in terms of humane, so even not even talking about taking their life, but just the idea of the fact that they're seen as an object to be manipulated, to be treated however you want to treat them. You know, there's no animal cruelty laws protecting them. Uh, they're your slave in your property, pretty much. Right. It, yes. So, so again, please... Don't be fooled by all this marketing that's telling you uh, that you can purchase these things and somehow not be contributing to systems of oppression and violence and abuse. Right. A lot of the labels that you see on these products, for example, um, cage-free, free-range, they basically mean nothing. Like the, there's no real uh, regulation or uh, they don't, they definitely don't mean what you think they mean. Let's say that, um, you know, cage free eggs. Yeah. They've been taken out of the battery cages. These, these hens who are there to lay eggs, but um, they are on this overcrowded, filthy floor where they can't, they still can't even move. And, you know, they're getting trampled on by each other. Their, their skin is getting burned off or, you know, they're getting bur they're sustaining burns on their flesh from the ammonia and the manure that they're all sitting in. Wow. You know, so, so is that really better? You know, and the pecking it, order as well. Exactly. They're getting, yeah, they're, they're harassing each other because they're under so much stress. Uh, it, you know, and. Like free range, you know, there's there's undercover footage of farmers just laughing about that label. Like, oh yeah, we we're certified free range, but all that really means is in our sheds, these huge overcrowded sheds, there's a, a window open at the end, which of course the majority of the birds couldn't reach or couldn't get to if they want if they wanted to. Right. 
But just because there's an open window somewhere part of the time, they get to be certified free range. Right. So don't, again, please don't be fooled by these marketing labels. They really don't mean that the animals have been treated any better. Uh, Sounds like they're being treated worse. I mean, especially overcrowding. Everything we've talked about in other podcasts with disease, the spread of disease. I mean, you you overcrowd any population and you're just going to increase. And the pecking order, the fact that, you know, they're... (laughs) In some ways, less protected than with cages if you can't even go there. Right, yeah. right. You're going to increase disease and everything and all the issues. I mean, same with the, same with the excrement, right? The uh, the waste. Yeah. It's just, it increases and it just, and, you know, we've heard, I mean, I'm just repeating things we've already said in other podcasts, but just the stench, you know, of all this combined. Um, so, yeah, free range is, is pretty funny. It's almost a joke. Yeah. yeah. You know. Now, the one label that does have some standards and regulations is the label organic. But we, we wanted to point out, and it's, it's so brilliantly explained in this anthology, that oftentimes labels like organic or animals living uh, through like the organic system or an organically certified farm actually have a harder life. They actually suffer more. And one just example of that is on a dairy farm. So the, the label organic, one of the things that means is that you cannot administer uh, drugs, medicines, uh, specifically uh, you know, antibiotics to the animals. So that's to protect the health of the consumer, the human consumer, right? Because a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to be ingesting all of these medications and drugs and antibiotics through, you know, eating the animal's milk or flesh. Uh, So, you know, on a conventional dairy farm, if a cow starts presenting symptoms of mastitis, they're often given, you know, at least the farmer will often try to give them antibiotics to to mitigate that infection. Right. Um, But on an organic milk farm, that cow just has to suffer with that mastitis untreated. Wow. Uh, And then... So what that means is usually they have to go to slaughter even more quickly, more soon than dairy dairy cows, which already are sent to slaughter at just a few years old because their bodies give out from so much abuse. So while this is a quote from this chapter, they say, while investigating organic dairy production, I spoke to a Sonoma County farmed animal veterinarian who wished to remain anonymous. He confided in me that he had, he saw cows in the most advanced stages of mastitis with open sores on their udders flowing with pus in severe pain at milking with stinging tender teats on organic dairies. He reported that there appeared to be an increase in the worst cases he has seen in decades of dairy vet care because so many farms were transitioning to the new organic standards that don't allow for the medications that the animals need. So again, like this, this push to try to appear more humane, more healthy, you know, is actually, and this is just one great, one of many examples of how it's actually causing animals to suffer more. That is so and crazy. for them to make more money. <laughs> yeah, they get to make them. more money. And, and, and really what it comes down to, I mean, I was thinking about this earlier when we started this whole conversation. It's actually, you know, given this consumer playing into the consumer's uh, sense of choice or freedom. Do you know what I mean? Like they get to choose, like they have these options. Hey, if you want humane uh, meat, we have it. If you just want regular conventional meat, uh, cause you hate vegans and people like that. We have that too. You know what I mean? Like, and, and similar to what mm. you're saying here, you know, as we know, the other irony is that people charge a little more for organic, right? So you're paying more money. <laughs> To, to abuse the animals. So it's even worse for the animals yeah. because if they have more money, they abuse more and they exploit more. No, and it's just more. the whole thing. It's, it's people think, people think, like the Orwell you mentioned, people think they're doing good and they feel better, but then it's actually worse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the company, the ag company gets more money. It's crazy. Right. Another thing I think it's good to address is, that this book spends time on is a trend that we're starting to see more and more uh, with people who are like, oh, yeah, factory farming, the industrial animal agriculture, 
a business is something I don't want to support. And so what people are starting to do more and more, kind of with, with the backyard eggs, is is starting to get back to nature themselves and, and becoming like do-it-yourself farmers, um, do-it-yourself slaughterers. Um, there's a couple chapters in this book that address this phenomenon that somehow somehow we can be morally less, I don't know, guilty if we do it ourselves right. in our own backyard. Well, I just saw that. With a, there's a new article in The Atlantic about hunting, and, and a lot of people who make who are hunters make this argument that they want to be more connected to their food. They think they're more mm-hmm. uh, natural, like it's better for them, it's better, it's more holistic, it's or, um, wholesome, I guess is the word I'm looking for. It's more wholesome to slaughter their own animal and use every part of it that they can and provide for their family, and they're just more connected to their family and more connected to nature, and they take responsibility for the death of the animal somehow and by using every part of it that they can. And it's almost this um, romantic uh, mm-hmm. storyline, do you know what I mean? And it it shows you just how much it's about making yourself feel better and not about the animal because the animal doesn't care who kills them, right? Or who exploits them. They care that they are. Right. Um, And so if if it makes you feel better that, like if you're doing it because you want to be more connected or whatever, like that has nothing to do with the animal. It's it's a mental construct that you've established for yourself, right? Right. And also like it's extremely problematic to, to link being connected to someone while you're killing them <laughs> against their will. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It drives me insane when people say that. It, it's so incredibly disconnected to the act that they're committing to this individual. Right. Yeah, they, lots of times they, they put all this spiritual language around it. Like somehow I'm a more spiritually in tune person because I'm respecting the life of this animal. I, I, there was a quote in the book where like, uh, one of these do-it-yourself slaughterers was saying, you know, I, I, I place my hand on the animal as they pass and I thank them for their lives. And yeah, I mean, that that sounds, I don't know, altruistic or something, but it's yeah, delusional. it's completely unnecessary. The worst thing you can do to any sentient being is take their very life. Right. Against their will, especially. Against their will. And you don't need the nutrients to survive and to flourish. Yeah. Millions of vegans can testify that you can thrive and be completely a healthy person. In fact, even more healthy. 100%. And the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, which is the biggest group of nutritionists uh, in the world. So, What was that? The Academy of Nutrition Dietetics says, mm. like, states that they're, according to many peer-reviewed studies, that a, ve- a well-planned vegan diet is suitable for all ages, athletes, and pregnancies. Yeah, it's yeah. not only us yeah. <laughs> saying yeah. it; it's a non-vegan organization too. Right. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and one one group of of people who's kind of going in this direction of you know buying their own farms and 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 raising and killing animals themselves is actually women, and it's it's almost like this. It's been, it's been established as like a new type of feminism, uh, where these women will leave their corporate jobs uh, and go buy a farm, and then it's like they're they're melding the maternal, caretaking, nurturing things that come naturally to women, but in the past have been seen as anti-feminist. They're melding that with trying to be equal to men with violence and killing animals. And wow. it's like this new feminism <laughs> called like f- <laughs> femi- femi- femivorism. Femivorism. No, fem- it's, femi- it's yes. femivorism. And then they write, really. they, they write and publish these memoirs. And I guess there's this whole new genre of nonfiction huh. memoirs of these women who are like, who are delighting in killing animals and and, you know, and empowered by it. Empowered by right. it. Yeah, like they're like, you know, men have nothing on us. Like almost like I'm not the victim anymore. Now I can kill animals. I can animals. victimize someone else. I get to right. victimize someone else and it's like empowering. That is so strange. It's very, very fascinating. Whereas, you know, the our, our feminist ancestors from the 70s were all about, no, we don't want equality with men. We want to completely remake society in ways that don't celebrate war and violence and oppression like let's mm. you know let's get away from this this bloodlust yeah not right. be equal and in oppression right. like not be as oppressive yeah as uh, they were being treated but my like, lights like flipping well, see, the that just seems yeah, like a whole big tables. power thing you know is what it comes down to uh especially in, in you know i mean obviously i worked in corporate america for a long time and and 
and there's, you know, all the arguments that women don't get paid the same as men. And I mean, this goes throughout. And so maybe this is some way for former corporate women to take back some level of power or equality. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have, I, I don't mean, know, that's but. what their thought process is at. Yeah. 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 It's almost like, well, we achieved professional success. So we thought that would bring us happiness, like yeah. be, being like, you know, in corporate America, but we still feel this emptiness. And so now we're going to try to find it by animal mm. exploitation, I guess. Or romanticized animal. Uh, yeah. Because it is romanticized. That's it also is. why they go there. But like they were mentioning in, in this, uh, like the podcast about this book, actually, um, that they, they were wondering, well, then why don't they go to plant farming instead? You mm, know, right. if they want this romanticized re- re- return to nature. Right. Uh, as was like, no, no, like the, the reason why you go to the animal farming is because of this, like, I can do it like the men can do it kind of a right. mentality. Like, And I can see somehow how managing a farm and everything that goes into it and all the demands... And, and being able to like succe- be successful at that is something to admire. Um, but like you said, you could do it with plants. Yeah, and you it's not. I mean? It's just not. Uh, you're not proving as much that you can be just ag- as aggressive and that you you can do it all kind of thing because you're not actually killing an animal. You're not. You know, like you're not being violent in that sense. Mm. So mm. apparently, that's where. I mean, I find it it's super strange as well. Yeah, we have to exert power somehow. Yeah, but. I've always heard, too, that some of the most powerful people are the people that actually withhold their power, mm-hmm. you know. However, so. your own, you know, yeah. impulses. Or, or use your power to actually protect yes. right. the vulnerable. Right. Yeah, I didn't mean withhold your power like in, when, when it's needed. I meant, mm-hmm. like, not exert it. In because it's weak, like, in terms of uh, character. Like, right. it's, you know, it's like a bully. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, to kind of start to wrap up and bring this to a close, uh, I think the point, the big point here is we all know that advertising is lying to us, right? All sorts of advertising, not just around animal agribusiness. But uh, so we need to be thoughtful. We need to stop and take a pause. Well, or manipulating us very mm-hmm. well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If, if, if not flat out lying, there's a lot of, lot right. of manipulation. Right. It could be explicitly on. lying or implicitly right. Deceiving, deceiving, you. or withholding, Missile. withholding some of the truth, mm-hmm. and and yes. and having you believe one thing when the exact opposite is true. Yeah, and I, I like the word manipulation because, you know, sometimes people um, accuse vegans of manipulating. Right? Well, why would you show me that? Why would you show my child that? Because you are so you're manipulating us with this guilt, and mm. you know the point is made in the book. Well, okay. Animal agribusiness and their advertising is manipulating f- you for money. Right. Uh, what's what's our objective when we show you this? It's it's to create a compassionate, loving world where right. all can live free of suffering. Well, so uh, who's doing the true manipulating? And yeah, and right. animal agriculture is actively trying to not have this footage be shown right. of what they are doing. They are doing that, and the activists are trying to show what is that happening. It's right. not like we made this movie up. It's not like yeah. it's just footage of what's happening. Right. Just the truth. When I, th- and I feel like, and I know we're running out of time, but I, I feel like w- what we talk about all the time in this show is, is the culture. Like, the, the way animals are treated and the way the factory, for, you know, way the animal agriculture industry is run is the norm. And we're shining a light and saying, actually, this isn't humane. This isn't good. And, and we're the crazy ones. But in fact, we're just pointing out what's culturally, what's normative in our culture that shouldn't be accepted. Mm-hmm. And so anyway. So, yeah, we, the, The conclusion of this book reads, we have to embrace the urgency and realize that we cannot just, quote, reform these industries. There are some industries that are so destructive, so cruel and damaging that they are unreformable and need to be dismantled and replaced. We cannot rely on the farmers, the ranchers, suppliers, marketers, and retailers to make these critical changes. It's up to us on a grassroots level on a personal level, these changes are necessary for survival. Going vegan is the least we can do. If the consumers lead, the leaders will follow. Wow. That's, that's so powerful. True. It is very powerful. And that says something about something you can do, even if you feel like, and I feel like we run in this argument all the time, right? Where 
Um, kind of what we were saying, things get relativized. Well, I'm not, I really can't do much. So why bother? Mm-hmm. We were, and then I feel like this pushes back against that. You actually can make a difference. And also uh, something that people don't know, which is powerful, is that a vegan saves a third, between 30 to 600 lives per year, just not by, by not mm-hmm. adding to the demand. Right. You know, so between 30 to 600 lives. That's crazy. And, yeah. and, and more people go vegan, less animals will be domesticated and or... Uh, yeah, bred, bred into bred. existence. And, and then we can, uh, we can slowly, maybe, maybe more quickly uh, make a change, you know. Yeah, and I, I, I'm excited for our next episode because we're going to get into the green washings uh, of animal agriculture and talk about uh, what it's doing to our planet and that, you know, these perceptions that there are better ways to do that. Um, we're going to talk through some of those too. Nice. Yeah, you can find us on YouTube and Spotify, Animalia Hour. And uh, you can also uh, email us at veganofbozeman at g- uh, gmail.com. Yeah. And uh, we also have uh, events every month. We can uh, find these events uh, on veg- uh, at Vegans of Bozeman. It's a Facebook group. All right. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, until next time. Live vegan. Live, Live vegan. vegan. Bye. Yeah, bye.